All right, we're gonna go on a little bit of a side quest today and talk about neutrinos and in particular why people who study this thing much more seriously than me are fairly confident that there's no way that neutrinos can explain the dark matter phenomena that have been observed. So as a uh, brief explanation of what both of those things are, so dark matter is exactly what it sounds like. It's matter that's dark and not just in the sense of being enigmatic or, you know, that we can't detect it in the sense it's literally dark. It does not emit light, right? That's its defining characteristic is there's something that's interacting uh, via gravity, right? Or, you know, we can see that things are being pulled towards each other, uh, but there's nothing emitting any light, which is the only thing that we can usually see coming away from uh, distant objects in the universe. And so it has been rather uncreatively uh, dubbed dark matter. Well, there's been a number of proposals over the year for like, okay, what, what could that be, right? There's, there is something doing that, right? Um, you know, it could be our understanding of gravity is wrong, but most likely there just is something that contains some mass and energy uh, that is exerting gravity, but that isn't emitting light. Uh, so there's actually a bunch of things that fit that description that we already know about. There's, you know, well, there's black holes, right? That might be your first thought, like, oh, of course, well, black holes don't emit any light, they're dark, and they certainly have plenty of, uh, plenty of mass to exert some gravity. Um, and it's like, well, that's a, a very, you know, that's a, a clever idea. It certainly makes sense, uh, but there's a number of problems. Uh, the biggest one being we can, in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, we can, roughly speaking, observe the overall density of black holes. It could be that there's more than we think there are, but astronomers have been at this for, you know, like 50 years now, like dark matter goes all the way back to the 70s, and they have not found anywhere near the density of black holes um, and mass of those black holes in the Milky Way galaxy that we live in. Um, and they also haven't found them in the studies that they've done of other galaxies. So it could be that other that our galaxy is really weird and just doesn't have that many black holes. Uh, and it could be that we're also unable to observe the black holes for whatever reason in other in other galaxies, but uh, black holes, even though the black hole itself is dark, uh, the uh, the matter that's falling into the black hole, the accretion disk, is actually very, very bright. Uh, and so we're fairly sure it's not just black holes. Uh, there's actually another problem that ties into uh, some of the reasons we're going to explain why it can't be neutrinos either, which is uh, studies that have been done on, like, theoretical studies that have been done on what we think the early universe would have been like, um, we don't think that that many black holes could have formed. Uh, that's the only way, the only time when they could have realistically formed. And so it's it's a it's a double whammy of uh, we haven't seen them and we don't have any theoretical reason for believing that they would be there either. Okay, so your next thought might be, well, maybe it's not black holes. Maybe it's just a bunch of like you know uh, basically gas giants, right? Like they call them brown dwarfs, like Jupiter-sized objects that aren't quite big enough to be stars, so they don't emit any light, but they're still massive enough. Well, it can't really be that either for basically the same reason I said I said for black holes, which is we just don't see enough of them, right? We've done, or, you know, we uh, astronomers, because uh, I'm a condensed matter physicist, not an astrophysicist, but astrophysicists, astronomers have done surveys of our galaxy, and we just don't see them. Uh, and again, theory also backs this up, where we're fairly sure there's no way that that many brown dwarfs could have formed. Uh, so that's pretty much out, too. Because again, haven't seen them, and we don't have any theoretical basis for believing they're there. So, you know, it's always possible, but uh, the evidence is pretty strongly against it. Um, so that leaves us with what we generally say is the candidate for dark matter, which is uh, there. It's why it's why it's kind of funny that uh, um, the uh, acronyms for this end up being that we call those other objects have some acronym that turns into uh, jumbos, they call them. Uh, and then there's another candidate, which is generally what people look for in dark matter, which is something called a WIMP. Uh, and so WIMP stands for weakly interacting massive particles, right? So it's got to have four qualities. It's got to be weakly, weakly interacting. Uh, I guess that's uh, two properties with four, four words, but um, it's got to be 
it has to interact and it has to interact weekly. Um, so that's really one property because uh, if it didn't act, interact at all with anything, um, we wouldn't see it. But uh, actually, weekly interacting means something particular. It means it interacts via the weak nuclear force, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, and it has to be a massive thing, right? It has to have some mass, uh, and you know, it has to be a particle. It has to be some stable, uh, you know, thing that can exist. Um, so whether you want to call that two properties or four, I don't know. But it has to be a weakly interacting massive particle. Um, and so there's already something by just that description. There's these things called neutrinos, right? And what a neutrino is, is it's a, uh, just, it's a particle that exists and it, it uh, ticks all those boxes, right? It interacts via the weak nuclear force, which is a very, very weak force. Um, and it has, a, it has a very, very small mass, but it doesn't have zero mass. So it is a massive particle. It's a particle, it has mass, it interacts, and it interacts via the weak force. There you go. Um, so you might think, aha, all right, now we ha really have solved it. We needed a weakly interacting massive particle. Neutrinos are weakly interacting massive particles. There you go. Well, hold on. <laughs> it doesn't quite work out so easily. And the reasons for that are several fold. Um, one is we just don't observe enough of them. But there's a lot of finicky aspects to that. And neutrinos, by their very nature, are very, very hard to observe. Um, so again, we have a, an experimental reason for doubting that neutrinos could be the dark matter. Uh, but again, there's actually, in this case, a very, very important theoretical reason, too. And that reason ties into my field of condensed matter physics because it has to do with, you know, our favorite thing in the world, phase transitions, which here's a phase transition in process. There's a glass of ice melting in a mason jar so I can be a hipster. Refreshing. Um, and so we'll, you know, play a lovely, uh, you know, forwards and backwards ice melting and uh, freezing for you, even though the freezing is just playing it backwards because I didn't want to put my phone in the freezer. Um, so yeah, there you go. Phase transitions. What do those have to do with uh, neutrinos being dark matter? Well, this is where it gets kind of hard to use analogies, so I'm just going to try to explain things as directly as I can. The one sentence summary of why we're pretty sure neutrinos can't be the dark matter is we need something called cold dark matter. Uh, and this is where it kind of starts tying into the phase transition, right? So when we say cold, we mean that it has to be low enough in the average kinetic energies of the particles, right, uh, that they can actually coalesce around galaxies and account for um, the amount of gravitational mass in, in those galaxies, right? Because if you have hot, so-called hot dark matter, which is, you know, matter, it's, you know, matter that does not emit light and that still interacts gravitationally, but it's just zipping around through space, right? It'll sort of pass right through a galaxy. And because it only interacts via gravity, it won't slow down when it does. Uh, and the only way it can lose energy is via, it, it can lose energy via gravitational waves at two actually, but that's a very bad way for things to lose energy. Uh, and via the weak force, both of which are very, very slow. And so uh, it's very difficult for dark matter to actually cool down. Um, but it has to cool down in order to coalesce into the galaxies to actually hold them together, which is what dark matter is. It's the mysterious stuff exerting gravity on galaxies beyond the matter that we can see emitting light. Um, so why aren't neutrinos cold? So that's where it gets weird. Um, basically, the vast majority of the neutrinos that currently exist were created very early after the Big Bang. And there are neutrinos being created all the time by all sorts of nuclear processes, and there's a gajillions of them being made uh, in both in our sun and in every star in the universe. But all of that pales in comparison to the number that were created during the processes in the Big Bang. 
Um, and something that's kind of hard to explain now is when the Big Bang was happening, as the very, very, you know, hot, dense, you know, early universe was expanding, everything was cooling off, right? And so that's what we want. We want our dark matter to be getting cold. But the issue has to do with things cooling off at different rates, right? And so this is where it's kind of like, I just kind of have, you just kind of have to take my word for it because I can, I'll give you some analogies, but like, they're just kind of loose analogies. But as the universe was cooling and expanding, the different particles started decoupling from each other, right? The interactions between them started getting weaker and weaker as the universe expanded. And it's a question of, did any given particle, like neutrinos, become cool enough before they stopped interacting with everything else? And in the case of neutrinos, they, according to most theories, would have say frozen out hot, which means that they would have stopped interacting with all the other matter in the universe, except via the weak force, um, at a time when they were still very, very hot, and so was everything else. And so as a result of that, they would still be hot to this day. And so there are tons of neutrinos in the universe just zipping around, and they still haven't cooled off. Uh, even though the rest of the universe kind of has, um, which is very weird to think about that, you know, because they froze out when they were still hot, they're still hot, even though we're referring to this this process of freezing. And it's like, I guess the, the closest little analogy I can come up with in terms of little sort of objects is imagine you're sort of, you know, pushing some object along and then you drop it, right? If you're just pushing it along slowly and then drop it, it'll just drop versus if you get it going real fast and then and then let it go, it'll keep going, right? That's, you know, that's just kind of a, a, a quaint little analogy. Um, but the actual physics, you kind of have to take my word for it because it's it's really complicated. Um, I am sort of reciting this to you because uh, when I took a cosmology class, I took it in, in graduate school. I took the cosmology class I took from somebody that studied neutrinos. And so he really, really uh, emphasized this to us, why neutrinos almost certainly cannot account for the dark matter, which this is not a controversial opinion. Like this was, you know, one of people's first thoughts when dark matter was discovered is like, oh, maybe it's just the neutrinos. And like, well, that would be too easy, wouldn't it? Um, and uh, I'm also thinking about this because I, when I've, I've been writing my crummy science fiction and uh, neutrinos feature heavily uh, in that science fiction and the way they feature in it only sort of makes sense it's uh, I, I'd say I, I, I like to think of it as in the I, I have some futuristic technology where neutrino detection becomes much much easier um, that's not very realistic for the reasons I've discussed and there's a an off-sided statistic right that uh, or not statistic uh, you know physical law that like if if uh, if you had a sheet of lead that was a light year thick and you pass some neutrinos through them like more than half of them would make it through like you would absorb fewer than 50 percent of the neutrinos literally an entire light year thick sheet of solid lead that is how difficult it is to get neutrinos to interact with anything um so i, I like to think of it in the vein of uh michael crichton's uh, you know, writing of Jurassic Park, both the script for the movie and the novel, where, you know, could you really get DNA out of, you know, fossilized mosquitoes? No, it's, it's all, it's all garbled in there. Um, but do, is it based on real concepts? Yes. Um, so I've been thinking about neutrinos a lot because of that. Uh, and I thought I would mention this because uh, it's a cool little tidbit that uh, you'll often you'll often get when you're learning about uh, particle physics and learning about cosmology and you're like, oh, you know, we've got these weakly interacting massive particles, neutrinos, and we've got this search for dark matter where we're looking for weakly interactive massive particles that should be perfect. It's like, well, not so simple, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, yeah. It's a, it's a cool thing because this process of things decoupling from each other as they cool and then them sort of like ghosting around at whatever temperature they decoupled is a very sort of condensed matter physics-y idea where we're thinking about how things interact uh, depending on the sort of statistical mechanics and thermodynamics of these complex systems. And so I, I like this little uh, tidbit a lot. Uh, anyways, peace.